Hello friends, so today's video is going to be an impromptu discussion about a recent Wired article that was released titled Brandon Sanderson is your God. And beneath that it says he's the biggest fantasy writer in the world. He's also very Mormon. These things are profoundly related. The article is quite long, so I'm probably going to summarize a couple of parts or I might skip a couple of things here and there, but I do want to get through most of it. So I'm just going to jump right in. It starts by talking about how Sanderson was very, very successful, how his Kickstarter was very successful. And after his record-breaking Kickstarter, this particular writer says, I came to the Wired offices ready to gossip. How'd he do it? Why now? Is Brandon Sanderson even a good writer? Nobody had the first clue who or what I was talking about. On the one hand, who cares? Sanderson has millions upon millions of fans all over the planet. It doesn't matter that some losers at a single magazine, even if it is one of the nerdier ones, had never heard of him. On the other, the ignorance goes far beyond Wired. As far as I can tell, Sanderson, who has been topping bestseller lists for the better part of the 21st century, has not been written about in any depth by any major publication ever. I called his publicist to confirm. Well, we have a piece coming up in LDS Living, he told me. That's LDS as in Latter-day Saints. It's a magazine for Mormons. Which makes sense. Sanderson is extremely Mormon. What makes less sense is why there's a hole the size of Utah where the man's literary reputation should be. Is it because he mostly writes fantasy a, so the snob sneer, sub-literary genre? But then, so do J.K. Rowling, Margaret Atwood, and George R.R. R. Martin, and their household names. Is it because none of Sanderson's works have been adapted for the screen? Well, he wrote three of the Wheel of Time books, and an adaptation of that series came out on Amazon Prime in 2021. Could it be, finally, because he's a weirdo Mormon? But so are Orson Scott Card, Glenn A. Larson, and Stephanie Meyer, Mormon, I mean. Only Orson Scott Card is also a weirdo. Sanderson, when I eventually meet him in person, makes versions of these excuses, plus others, for his writerly obscurity. It's kind of fun to talk about, until it isn't, and that's when I real realize in a panic that I now have a problem. Sanderson is excited to talk about his reputation. He's excited, really, to talk about anything, but none of his self-analysis is, for my purposes, exciting. In fact, at that first dinner, over a flopsy Utah Chinese this being days before I'd meet his extended family and attend his fan convention and take his son to a theme park and cry in his basement. I find Sanderson depressingly, story-killingly lame. So that's the opening of the article. I'll get into more here in just a second, but I just want to start by saying that I don't care for that last part of that opening. I think that anybody who is passionate about what they do, I often find it really interesting to hear them talk about that. So to describe somebody as, even if you don't care about what they're talking about, to, to describe a person expressing their passions as depressingly, story-killingly lame, I already was like, okay, <coughs> excuse me, still getting over being sick. I already was thinking, I hope you turn this around because I am not even feeling this way because I'm a fan of Sanderson's works. I feel this way because that's an insulting thing to say. Doesn't matter, fill in the blank, any other author. That's very insulting. I'm sorry that he's not constantly entertaining you or giving you what you need to write what you think would be a great article. Maybe ask better questions then. I don't really think there's any excuse unless the point is to show that you aren't very kind, which I suppose if that was your goal, you succeeded. I just don't think there's, there's never a purpose for something when it's not like <laughs> he's been really cruel or really rude to you because I could kind of understand if he was very, very, very rude that you would be like, well, <sighs> this is what I thought of him. That would make sense. But anywho, I digress, we'll continue on. He sits across from me in an empty restaurant, kind of lordly and sure of his insights. Oh gosh, I forgot how much <laughs> he just doubles down on being rude. Anyway, in a graphic t-shirt and ill-fitting blazer, which he says he wears because it makes him look professorial. It doesn't, he isn't, unless the word means only believing everything you say is worth saying. You, I have to pause again. You came to Utah to ask him about his success. And he is talking to you about his 
he can't know for a fact what the magic formula is, but he's talking to you about it because that's why you're there to write about Sanderson and his success. I mean, that's what you started with. Why him? How did he do it? And so he's telling you and you're like, "Ugh, I'm bored. Also, his clothes are bad. <laughs> I, <coughs> again, would be annoyed if you're, imagine, imagine him writing about, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It could be any, I already think it's rude, anybody. But I just, I feel like a little bit, we might feel, I think people are already probably upset and annoyed by this, regardless of whether you're a fan. But imagine like a woman sitting down and if they're just like, her hair is done really poorly and her makeup isn't blended very well and her clothes look like cheap knockoffs. Like you would immediately just be like, okay, what does that have to do with her as a writer again? <laughs> I thought you were there to find out about her as a writer, not judge her for her clothes and how she talks. It would also be super unhelpful if you asked him, hey, what do you think has contributed to your success? What contributed to your Kickstarter campaign doing so well? Why do you think all these major publications haven't really written about you despite being a major bestseller? And if the person was like, I don't know, that's not helpful. He's trying to give you an answer to the best of his knowledge. After mocking Sanderson's clothing, he says, Sanderson talks a lot, but almost none of it is usable or quotable. I begin to think this is what I drove all the way from San Francisco to the suburbs of Salt Lake City in the freezing cold dead of winter for. <laughs> talks about driving really far. For previous, sorry, for previously frozen dim sum and freeze dried conversation, this must be why nobody writes about Brandon Sanderson. So recklessly, I say what's on my mind. I have to. His wife is there, his biggest fan, always his first reader making polite comments. I don't care. Maybe nobody writes about you, I say to Sanderson, because you don't write very well. The world unfreezes. He agrees. <laughs> I just, this is not anything new. Reviewers for a long time, even reviewers that are fans, are fine saying Sanderson's writing, the literal writing itself, is not anything to, to be kind of punny here. It's not anything to write home about. And he himself has said many a time, he uses the stained glass window analogy. What he will say, and I'm paraphrasing, is that for some people, if you think of writing as the window, for some people it's the stained glass window and that's what they're concerned about is the beauty of the window. And what he's interested in is writing about what's outside the window. So for him, it doesn't matter if the window itself is all that elaborate or intricate. What matters to him is what's on the outside of it and what he is describing to you, the view from outside the window. And can you have both? Can you have a beautiful window writing? and also an amazing story, of course. But that's not necessarily the thing that most of the fans or people who aren't fans, pretty much anybody who's read his works, most of them do not come to his books because they're so moved by the beautiful writing. Does that mean there aren't quotable moments? Does that mean there aren't hard hitting moments? Does that mean it's not sometimes philosophical? Does that mean there's not sometimes things that come up that really make you think? Of course not, of course those things exist in his books. You don't have to have beautiful prose but that would be the way that most people would describe it. So I don't know why we have to have this, the world unfreezes. It was never frozen for the rest of us. It's not that Brandon Sanderson can't write. Oh, this part, he just goes on about how Sanderson is obsessed with writing and he writes, 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 writes all the time. So we know this. Most will hear this and think at that rate, none of the words could possibly be any good. They'd be right in a way. And that's what Sanderson agrees with. At the sentence level, he is no great gift to English prose. I'm so sorry to keep pausing, but I just, part of what I don't like about articles like this is I would like to see quotes because the way that this is framed is saying Sanderson agrees with the idea that none of what he writes is really very good. To reread that again, most will hear this and think at that rate, none of the words could possibly be any good. They'd be right in a way and that's what Sanderson agrees with. But I think that that's twisting his words. If you go back to the stained glass analogy, he's not saying, I just bust the glass down and I'm like, it doesn't even, it barely even exists. Who cares about the writing? It's not like he's like, none of it's good at all. He's just saying it's not the thing that he's concerned with. And it's certainly not going to maybe be something that you compare to some of the other works that are known for having beautiful prose. I just find that perhaps Sanderson agreed that writing is not his strongest point or that Writing isn't the thing he's the most focused on, but to word it this way, to be like, here's what most people would think, and Sanderson would agree, I just think is misleading because I don't know that Sanderson himself is literally saying, 
I'm not very good at actually writing. <laughs> I don't know if those exact words came out of his mouth or if Sanderson was like, oh, at the rate I write, most of it's pretty bad, but oh well, people read it. That's not really the impression I would imagine Sanderson was giving, but articles like this, it makes it very easy to twist things to do one of two things, upset the fandom and or write things in a way that people who are unfamiliar with Sanderson, and it would seem that would be a fair amount of people even at his own office, given what he said at the beginning, you're writing to a group of people that know nothing about Sanderson, so their first impression of him is whatever you tell them. And what's sad is that fans who might get upset about an article like this, fine if you don't think Sanderson's writing is all that great. It's nothing new to us. Plenty of us have seen our friends say the same thing. A lot of us are friends with each other in these little online circles, and some of our friends can't stand Sanderson's writing and can't, some of them, even stand his magic or his worlds or his characters. They hate literally everything he's written. We've seen review after review after review say these sorts of things. We're used to it. It's not that that is upsetting. It's the way in which you have taken things that are removed from Sanderson's success, which is what you set your article up to be about, it's nothing about his success. You're mocking how he dresses, you're mocking the way he carries himself, and I would be upset no matter what writer it is because you're being insulting to another human being for no reason other than to get attention. And that's the thing is, fantasy fandoms have a certain reputation for being vicious and ridiculous, and you've seen it time and time again when adaptations come out and people get so upset because the actors don't fit perfectly with how they're described in the books. And those people, absolutely, a lot of us cannot stand that kind of behavior. It is so insignificant and unimportant, and it drives a lot of us up a wall, but we sort of get lumped in with them so that anytime we do talk about something that is upsetting to us, we get seen once again as just those nerds over there getting all upset over stupid stuff, when in actuality, I think that it's completely fair to be upset at how rude you are, <laughs> about how rude you are being and how dismissive and condescending you are being, and the impression, again, that you are trying to have on a group of people that likely don't know anything about Sanderson. And the reason I'm hitting this point is because later he even goes into detail about describing what world building is, and any fantasy fan would already know what world building is, which is why I don't really think he wrote this article in any fashion to appeal or be of interest to, or even extend a hand and say, maybe we disagree, but let's have a conversation. I don't think he's attempting to do any of that. I think that he's likely writing for the people that don't know about Sanderson, and then he knows that the fandom will get upset enough that it's still going to create traction with this article, which is only then going to make it seen by these people over here, and it's going to have us look like we are on opposing sides. But I just kind of feel like anybody who is polite and courteous and respectful, they know the difference between criticizing somebody's works and being critical of insignificant, unimportant things. Next paragraph, he provides some quotes that, no, they're not the best quotes uh, from Mistborn specifically. So he's talking about the way it says, uh, one of the quotes, it was going to be very bad this time. And then another quote, she felt a feeling of dread, which you would just say she felt dread. And then the fact that there's the redundant description, so it says tranquil, quiet, peaceful, that those follow each other, and it's they're all very similar types of words, so you don't really need to repeat the same thing. Of his own work, Sanderson has said, I detest rewriting. I write for endings. I write to relax. It shows. He writes by one metric at a sixth grade reading level. Goes on to say, here's where I'll stop using Sanderson's words written or spoken against him. It's not fair. Mm. But it was fair to do so before, but apparently not now. Anyway, <laughs> 10 seconds to go until the launch. The lights are flashing, the music thumping. This is sick. One, someone whispers behind me. I, I have to highlight again, this is, there's an impression of the fandom. I'm not saying that that didn't happen. I'm sure somebody was like, this is sick. This is so cool. I'm sure that happened at the convention. But this impression of Sanderson fans that, of fantasy fans that people have who are not within any kind of fandom whatsoever or are even a part of any group of people that likes fantasy, there is this impression of us. So to have this like 
this is sick as an example of one of the things you overheard i just i feel like you're still just trying to feed into and perpetuate stereotypes anywho uh to repeat this is sick someone whispers behind me as a cosmere's worth of nerds count down the remaining seconds at zero an enormous applause then the vp of merchandising and events walks out this is dragon steel 2022 the second annual convention he goes on to talk about the convention how there's thousands of people and how they predict that when stormlight archive 5 comes out there will probably be twelve thousand people and that the dragon steel planners will need to think bigger Continuing on, for now, the fans, even the turned away ones, are in unconquerable spirits, as is typically the case at these things. There's a general air, warmish, body odored, of unself consciousness. Thank you for continuing to prove the point that you are just trying to perpetuate what fantasy fans are like, and you continue to do so in this paragraph. So let's keep going. By my rough count, some three quarters of the attendees are men, boys, men, boys blurring together in a mass of pale, fleshy nerdery and Sanderson-appropriate graphic tees. The women, fewer in number, tend to be the better cosplayers. Lots of billowing cloaks, sprightly makeups, precious weapons. There's an arena for re refereed fights. If you don't come prepared, never fear, because the sprawl of purchasable Sanderson alia is endless art clothes figurines games jewelries ornaments special edition books a letter opener not available yet in the style of a <laughs> telepathic sword named nightblood and then he goes on to talk about how people at the convention are just such nerds and one of them says i'm here basically because i'm a huge nerd Everyone is smiling, sharing info and panel gossip. One guy from Massachusetts tells me he spent just a hundred, he just spent $170 on a rubber sword, not night blood. <laughs> and then he says it's bigger than he is. He won't be able to take it on the plane home. And he talks more about how like, look at all these nerds with their fandom merch. The one question I ask practically everyone is, why Sanderson? I only need to ask it a few times to realize the answer is always the same. It's a two-parter. First part, Sanderson's characters. They feel like real people, everyone insists. Multiple parents say they've named their kids after their favorites. So they go on to talk about that. The second answer to why Sanderson is his worlds. This is probably what he's best known for, world building, as it's called. Sanderson dreams up far off lands, sometimes cities, sometimes whole planets, with rules and systems and politics, and then he populates them with characters whose fates are also the worlds. So the second answer is just the inverse of the first. You can't have world building without character building. So just basic fantasy writing? Anyway, some characters die, some become gods. The good ones, and most of them are good, are very good, inspiringly so. Inspiringly good, sorry. No one has sex, they only save lives. But nobody, not a single person, complains about in my two days walking the palace floors is Sanderson's writing. Well, if you're asking them why Sanderson, they're not gonna be like, not his writing. <laughs> why would anybody answer that way? <laughs> anyway, if they mention his sentences at all, it's merely to acknowledge that they're easier to read than, say, Tolkien's, whose work they may well graduate to with Sanderson lighting the way, which is ironic given that when you started this, you talked about how some people are snobs and would call fantasy subpar, and then you partake in that same kind of language by talking about how we would graduate to this next thing and Sanderson is just the baby step to where we're eventually going. As if every Sanderson fan hasn't already potentially read Tolkien. Still, I can't help but try to trip them up. Surely he's not a great writer, I prod. Polite, embarrassed smiles. Not embarrassed because they like Sanderson's works, which is what it seems like you're trying to say. They're suspicious of me, I can tell. People generally are suspicious of someone at a convention for something that is primarily filled with people who are fans and someone's coming around being like, yeah, but he kind of sucks a little bit, doesn't he? Huh? Huh? Can I get you to admit it? And they're probably smiling politely, but somewhat embarrassed because they don't want to be rude to the person that's asking them to trash one of their favorite authors, I, I, and also have people that are on like late night shows and they'll be like, hey, can you answer a question? They'll put a microphone in your face and they're trying to get a little sound bite of you sounding stupid. And so when somebody's coming up to you at, once again, to repeat myself, a convention filled with fans and they're coming up to you and they're asking you, so he's not actually a great writer, right? 
They probably think, I don't know my Kaladin from my Adolin. I do. I even like Kaladin. The scene midway through Way of Kings where Kaladin talks to a mysterious stranger. It's Hoyd on the Shattered Plains. A story doesn't live until it is imagined in someone's mind, Hoyd says. Do I know what that means? Not exactly. And that's exactly why I read science fiction and fantasy. I've pretty much only read science fiction and fantasy my entire life for those plays at profundity, at the essence of storytelling, storytelling beyond words. But what am I saying? Gibberish, most likely. Sanderson is a bad writer. I've already said it. Here at the convention, most of the panelists aren't even writers. People don't care about sentences. They care about Sanderson. No, I don't care. Okay, I care about Sanderson on the on the level of like, I care about human beings, generally speaking. Uh, but I care about a good story. I sit through multiple panels about the future of his publishing company, which is called, as is the convention, you'll note, Dragonsteel. Post Kickstarter campaign, the company is now 50 some people slash Mormons strong. This is the year of Sanderson, the panelists keep saying. Four new books with special swag for backers, new toys and sparkly bookmarks. Now they're talking about warehouse expansion efforts. Now they're talking about a possible future bookstore housed in a castle or something. When will the Dragonsteel amusement park be built? Someone asks. The audience hoots. All this, I think to myself, is not the spirit of fantasy. If it's world building, it's only world building one thing. The world builder's world. <laughs> Goes on to talk about going to Sanderson's house and hanging out with Sanderson and showering and talking to various different people that work for Dragon Steel. He also kind of talks about how vanilla everybody is. He says, it's the most PG gathering of writer types I've ever been to. There are chips and sodas. Someone baked an apple crisp. Before the meetup kicks off, I corner some regulars in the kitchen. They're gossiping, cracking jokes. One Dragon Steel's new head of narrative lets slip that Sanderson feels no pain. And then he really, really wants to know more about the fact that Sanderson evidently doesn't feel pain. He then talks about going to Sanderson's personal home theater and crying at the movie, The Greatest Showman. And he says he cried despite the fact that he thinks Hugh Jackman is lame. So there's another person that he thinks is lame. Skipping quite a bit ahead, he talks about how he's asking Sanderson about being Mormon, about these profound moments in his life that have led him to believe a certain path is the one he should take. That's fine, he says. Then let's talk about Mormonism in another way. Let's talk about it as it relates to fantasy. Because it's no secret, Mormonism is the fantasy of religion, the science fiction edition of Christianity, I've heard it called, with its angels and alternative histories, embodied gods, visions, and plates made of gold. What I don't like about that statement is it's almost like implying, well, Christianity is normal, but Mormonism is the sci-fi version of Christianity, you know, because of like the angels and stuff, when in actuality, I would say you could describe any religion that way. Sanderson knows I want to know if what he's doing, writing fantasy books, is fundamentally in some way, some very central way, Mormon. Of course it is, he says. The world building, the gods incarnate, the systems of magic. So much of Mormonism is about rules. So are his books, where miracles don't happen unless you put in the work. That's when, between mouthfuls of pork cutlet, Sanderson makes the connection between his work and the work of his heavenly father explicit. This is when he speaks the seven words of truth, the only ones I'm certain he has never said in quite this way ever before. What makes you sure? You were talking before about how you think Sanderson speaks in a way of he's very sure of his own insights, and then yet you say that you are sure you're certain he has never said in quite this way. How do you know that? How do you know that? Sorry. Anyway, as I build books, Sanderson says, as I sit there for once entirely enraptured, I'm glad finally you were able to concentrate enough to be interested in what he was saying to you. Anyway, as I build books, God builds people. Oh, wow. So he's like a weirdo Mormon who writes the same way God makes people. So him being Mormon is completely tied to him being an author. I just think this is such a reach. You're trying so hard to make your article seem profound and interesting. And sorry, you had nothing. So instead you relied on people's misunderstanding and lack of understanding of fantasy fans, fantasy as a whole, as a genre, and what typically people are drawn to fantasy for, and you're relying on people's ignorance of a religion to try to write your article to make it seem catchy and interesting. And look at Sanderson, like he's kind of weird, right? He then goes on to talk about how he went with Sanderson to an amusement park. And then he talks about how Sanderson gets recognized and how guys, a surprising number of 
guys ask for autographs, quote, for my girlfriend. And I think the implication there is the guys just want the autographs and they probably don't have girlfriends, but they can't just ask for an autograph. And so they're pretending it's for their girlfriends. Anyway, lots of people have already finished the latest book, which came out like yesterday. Sanderson shines in these situations. He's your god, but he's your friend too. Okay, when it talked about how he is like, as god builds us, I create stories. It's not... <laughs> That's not the same as saying, I am a god and all of my book fans worship me. That's not the same thing. The article ends on, I suspect there will be big announcements soon. There have to be in regards to adaptations and things. Sanderson is bigger than ever. A good writer? Who knows? What I do know now is this. So many of us mistake sentences for story, but story is the thing. Things happening, characters changing, surprise endings. As I drive us back to the house, drop off the kid, Sanderson's son, and then stay in the car with Sanderson a bit longer, talking about life, talking about worlds. My ending takes shape. The surprise is that it was Sanderson's ending all along. The ending of his best books. A character becomes a god, and the god beholds his planet below. If Sanderson is a writer, that is all he is doing. He is living his fantasy of godhead on earth. That wraps up this particular article. I'm going to go ahead and cut this off because I know this video probably already was pretty long. I would love to know all of your thoughts, so please feel free to let me know what you think in the comment section down below. I hope all of you have a lovely rest of your day, and I'll see you later. Bye.